Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's session of the College of Engineering Virtual Brown Bag Series. Today, we'll be hearing from Voss Kalayiru, Vice President and Survey Project Leader with Half Associates. First, before we get started, we have a couple of housekeeping items. First thing is, if you have any questions or comments, please post them in the Q&A chat at the top right of your screen. We'll get those answered as we go along. Um, also, please be sure to check out the full schedule for the uh, virtual brown bag series. The URL for that is also in, posted in the chat. Voss started his surveying career in Greece more than 25 years ago through his surveying family business. He's a third generation surveyor. He moved to Dallas in 2005 and started working for Half Associates, which is where he's the survey practice leader and vice president today. He has managed several commercial improvement surveys, right of way surveys, FEMA elevation certificates, oil and gas and topographic surveying projects in various parts of Texas and other states. Voss is a licensed surveyor in five states, including Texas. And since 2007, he has been coordinating the RPLS and SIT study groups in the DFW area and served as president of the TSPS Chapter 5 in 2021. Voss is also an adjunct professor teaching courses in GIS and geodetic surveying at DCCD's North Lake College since 2015. That's the introduction that I've got for him. So Voss, I'll turn it over to you and we'll look forward to hearing a great presentation. All right, Jeremy, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate everybody for having me over. Before I get started, I would like to say that this is a, a pretty heavy topic subject. It's one that um, a lot of surveyors and engineers can easily get confused over. Uh, we can go into as much depth or, um, or as light as we want to. So I'll try to make this uh, presentation as easy to, uh, for everybody to comprehend. Um, also, I would like, before I start, I would like to thank uh, Trevor Jeremy. Uh, he's an RPLS with Half and Associates. Trevor and I, we work together with the Oklahoma Department of Transportation and uh, Richard Navas uh, for the development of the low distortion projections uh, over the last couple of years. And he has contributed a big part in this presentation as well. So starting off about the today's presentation and the impact of the new NGS 2022 datum and the low distortion projection. All surveying, GIS, engineering projects, um, they all have their deliverables, whether it's CAD drawings, geodatabases, maps, printed or electronic, be dependent on datums that are both relying on horizontal and uh, vertical information, whether we're referring to 2D vertical or, or 2D horizontal or 3D vertical information. Datums and projections have been going on for hundreds of years and they go hand by hand uh, because in the end of the day, the end products of those projected maps, they always depend on a datum, whether it's a global or a local one. Uh, what I usually say is uh, when we look at projections and datums, um, a good engineer uh, is someone who understands enough about surveying to ask the right questions. And the same thing with a surveyor. A good surveyor is someone who understands enough about engineering to know what they're asking so we can all protect the public in the end of the day. So with that said, uh, I'd like to start with uh, just some very basic concepts uh, of what's happening today. What do we have up to date with the datums, both horizontal and vertical, some very basic concepts of geodesy, and then we'll discuss about the new developments that are coming after 2022. So the basic concept of geodesy is that uh, all coordinates basically start from a Cartesian coordinate system, and those need to be expressed in geographic coordinates before we even start talking about any kind of projection. Those coordinates, the geographic coordinates are, as a general principle, they're described by latitude and longitude. Uh, longitude is based upon the positional location of each location, of each point, uh, whether being east or west of the prime meridian, which is uh, the line that is passing through uh, Point Greenwich in the UK. Latitude uh, is based upon the positional location of each point that is north and south of the equator. Both the latitude and longitude, uh, they're both expressed in degrees, uh, minutes and seconds. So when we describe the geographic coordinates, when we describe the latitude and we look at uh, how those angles and how those degrees, minutes, and seconds are calculated, the latitude is uh, 
of a point on an Earth's surface is the angle between the equatorial plane and the straight line that passes through that point and uh, through the center of the Earth. The longitude is the angle lambda um, after the Greek alphabet of a point on Earth's surface, uh, which is the angle east of west of a reference meridian to another meridian that passes through that same point. In the end of the day, all the meridians are halves of great ellipses, and they're often called great circles, and they all converge towards the north and the south pole, which is why um, in the end of the day, when you're talking about the latitude, when you look at the latitude on the north and the south pole, you're looking at either 90 degrees north or 90 degrees south, or, or plus 90 degrees for the north pole and minus 90 degrees uh, for the south pole. And the same concept when you're east or west of the uh, pr prime meridian that passes through Greenwich. If you're west of, um, uh, of that line, of that prime meridian, uh, you would describe that by a negative or a west indication of that degree um, uh, location. A practical example is, so let's say, uh, let's take uh, Richardson here in Texas. Uh, approximately the latitude and longitude of those of our location where we are is about 32.9 degrees uh, north of the equator uh, and about 96.7 degrees west of the prime meridian from uh, point green that passes through point Greenwich. And that latitude and longitude can either be expressed with uh, a plus 32.9 and minus 96.7 or 32.9 degrees north or west. And that's a general concept of how we find our reference through uh, the ellipse uh, that when we describe geographic coordinates. Another basic concept of uh, geodesy that we need to describe as we start talking about especially vertical datums later on is, is the geoid. The geoid as a general concept is uh, one that basically helps us as surveyors and engineers relate the vertical datum to orthometric elevations. And those are the elevations that our design and our survey calculations and our survey data collection depends upon. The geoid as a general concept is a gravitational model uh, that is generated by geophysicists. Uh, the geoid and its shape is, is the shape that the ocean surface would take under the influence of gravity. It's basically a hypothetical shape of the Earth at the mean sea level. The surface that is basically a zero elevation as if there was as if the whole earth was uh, covered by uh, by water. It's very useful, as I mentioned, for surveyors because it allows us to uh, measure the orthometric surface elevations. And the geoid is generally developed by and regulated by the National Geodetic Survey and NOAA. Generally speaking, uh, the geoid is updated by geophysicists, geophysicists anywhere between every three to six years. Currently, the most current geoid that we use um, for, um, for our uh, uh, vertical uh, calculus and our vertical datum is the geoid 18, but there have been previous versions of the geoid that have been used. There's no surveyor or engineer that develops the geoid. It's something that we take from other sciences, basically, and we implement it uh, through the geodetic principles to our calculations. Another basic concept that we have to talk about is the datum. And what is a datum? The datums are, as a general concept, is the basis of all the survey and engineering jobs that we perform. A geodetic datum or geodetic system is, is a system of, for precisely measuring the locations on Earth or other planetary body. In order to be unambiguous about the direction of the vertical or the horizontal surface that we refer to, above which we are measuring, map makers, uh, they choose a reference ellipsoid with a given origin and orientation that best fits the needs uh, for the area that we are about to map. The geodesists and surveyors use datums to create starting or reference points for floodplain maps, for property boundaries, for construction surveys, levee designs, or any other type of work requiring accurate coordinates 
that are consistent with one another and that we can have reference to. The horizontal datum is established through the latitude and longitude of ellipsoidal points, which we described a lot and long earlier, and the vertical datum is realized through the same ellipsoid and the geoid that we just referenced before being our reference surface. So after covering the, just those basic concepts of geodesy, let's discuss a little bit about how the horizontal and vertical datums are treated and the current geodetic horizontal and vertical datums that are currently implemented in North America, including Texas, of course. So let's start with the horizontal datums first. When we refer to the datum, we are we are we have the local datums and we also have earth centered datums or geocentric datums as we refer to them. A local datum is typically a, a, an ellipsoid that is closely trying to fit the Earth's surface in a particular area. An example of a local ellipsoid is the North American datum of NAD 27 that is still currently used, even though it's an older datum uh, that is based on the ellipsoid of Clark 1866, and that ellipsoid is a local ellipsoid. An Earth center, an Earth center or geo geocentric datum, that one uses the Earth's center or mass as the origin point of the datum. An example of um, an Earth center datum is uh, the GRS-80 or the WGS-84. The GRS-80 ellipsoid in particular is the one that is used as our ellipsoid for uh, the datum of NAD-83 and all the current projects that we're working on right now as of today uh, with uh, our own NAD83 for the most part, except for a few agencies that still utilize NAD27. An example of um, the other thing I would like to mention too is that um, WGS84 and GRS80 are extremely close to one another. And just to bring it this to a general concept, I like to teach, talk about this uh, during my class sometimes uh, when I teach the geodetic. Everybody knows Google Earth. And when we look at Google Earth and we type in a lot and long, why is Google Earth, when we type in a lot and long that came from NAD83, really close to where it's depicted on, on Google Earth? The reason is because Google Earth uses a global uh, ellipsoid. Uh, it's not the GRS-80 that NAD83 uses, it's not the WGS-84, it's a pseudo-ellipsoid, but it's still global ellipsoid that uh, is very close to the GRS-80. And that's what allows us in, in global coordinates being able to use any lat long and find our approximate location using Google Earth, for example. Going back to the <clears throat> primary datums that we have today uh, in North America, we have, as I mentioned, all the horizontal datums that we use is NAD27 and NAD83. Those two are two different, separate, completely independent datums. NAD83, as I mentioned earlier, is an Earth-centered one. NAD27 is a local one. Some of the key differences between them is that the NAD27 is based on a different ellipsoid, which I mentioned earlier was the Clark 1866, which is calculated by which was calculated by manual surveying of the content, uh, whereas NAD83 is based on geodetic uh, the reference system, the GRS80 ellipsoid. The NAD27 was calculated with a single point, which was in uh, Midas Ranch in, Cas in Kansas, and that was the datum point that um, was calculated where the NAD-3 was calculated as a geo geocentric reference system with no datum point. On this example here, um, we're showing kind of like where, if, if we use the same point of origin of those two ellipsoid Midas runs being the origin, you can see where the uh, center or the origin between those two ellipsoids are from one another. Uh, generally, they, they differ about 238 meters which in geodetic terms is a lot. <laughs> NAD-3, another key difference is that NAD-3 is more accurate than NAD-27. And the reason is because NAD-3 was a more advanced datum that was developed with GPS observations and a higher density of geodetic control that was used for its adjustment. 
Today, uh, NADD3 is the official legal horizontal datum for uh, the US federal government, and it is recognized by legislation in 48 out of the uh, 50 states. I would like to present this picture because it kind of speaks about the story of why those datums are different and what it means. This image basically describes the relative positional distortion between the latitude and longitude of those two datums in relative terms. So you can see that the latitude in certain geographic regions is about 30 meters as, as far as as much as 30 meters um, away in uh, positional distortion versus NAD 27. And the longitude is about 20 to 28 meters of longitude uh, positional distortion between the two. Something else that uh, I have to mention here too is that NAD 83, uh, when it was implemented in 1986, it has gone through multiple sets of adjustments that have taken place since then. And those adjustments were also made to account for the movement of the tectonic plates and the velocities uh, with the Earth being a, a living body and moving. So with that alone, NAD3 and the latest adjustments is a far more accurate datum than NAD27. Also, the other thing I would like to mention is the accuracy of the transformations between NAD27 and NAD83, where NOAA has developed and NGS has de have developed tools where we can have a backwards compatibility, if you like, where we can go from one datum to another. Typically, the accuracy of those transformations is anywhere between uh, 12 to 18 centimeters, and maybe sometimes, uh, so if you're looking at the 1986 adjustment, which was the original datum, it's about 12 to, 18, 12 to 18 centimeters, but if you look at today's most current uh, adjustment, uh, that accuracy of the transformation is about five to six centimeters. So if, if you have a project that needs to go from one datum to another and you're okay with the transformation having a relative accuracy of five to six centimeters by just plugging in the math and the conversions, then the transformation tools should be fine. But a lot of the, and five to six centimeters is about 15 to, 15 hundreds to two tenths of a US survey foot. So if you're looking into a more accurate conversion from one datum to the other, that's when you need feet on the ground and you need surveyors to be able to go out there and verify certain observations for you. So <clears throat> this is a general concept of uh, the keys or the steps that have been taken up until slide D. So, so far, based on the basic concept we have described, we have basically covered everything between A through D. So what we have covered so far is we start with A, which is the Earth's surface being a complex shape. Uh, then we go, go to step B, which is independently being able to handle the horizontal and vertical aspects of the surface. Then we move to step C, which is choosing the best fitting ellipsoid for the Earth's surface uh, that we will be dealing with. By moving and best creating a best fit ellipsoid, we move to D, which is defining the geodetic horizontal datum. And these steps are driven by predefined datums that surveyors and engineers can use that can create those surfaces. And from there, those datums then decide to utilize uh, which are the 2D mapping projections that we will be using. Essentially, the projections are geo geometric transformations of the spherical ellipsoidal coordinates, 3D coordinates as defined by the predefined datum and converting them into flat 2D maps. These 2D maps, uh, they can also depict 3D information through the independently selected vertical datum that we will be speaking about later. So uh, let's talk about those projections for now. So one thing to note about projections as a general concept is when the Earth is projected onto a flat surface, uh, there are at least four different types of distortions. There's a distortion in distance, direction, angle, and area. One thing to remember is that there is no projection that can preserve all four means of distortion on a flat map, but there are projections that can retain some of them. And that's where those the most common projections that we use in surveying today 
and engineering are the ones that uh, I'm showing you on the screen. So the most common one is the one that is actually currently being used in the state of Texas, which is the Lambert conformal conic projection. That's where all the meridians are equally spaced, straight lines converging to a main point, to a common point. Directions and angles and shapes are maintained uh, at all times where the distances are accurate only as long as we are close to those standard parallels. Generally speaking, the Lambert projection is actually a, an ideal type of projection for geographic regions that we want to project that are running mostly in an east to west direction. The second most common projection is the Mercator, Mercator which is a cylindrical projection. The transfer Mercator is basically a conformal map projection. It generally does not maintain true directions, but it maintains angles and shapes. Similar to or in uh, contrary to the to the Lambert projection, the Mercator one generally is applied for the transfer Mercator is generally applied for geographic regions that are running mostly in a north or south direction. And then we have the oblique uh, Mercator uh, projection, which is also one that is not as commonly used in many states today with the current datum, but it's actually used on one. Uh, but there will be more with the new uh, low distortion projections that we will be seeing a combination of those type of projections. So keep those projections uh, in the back of your minds. So another another way to so and depict how project how why projections come with no distortion is uh, is this image here. So if we take point uh, mid this point, which is the point that was used as a reference point for the NAD 27 datum in uh, in Kansas, you can see here a, a relative comparison uh, having that same origin point between when you project the entire un continental United States, uh, both on a Mercator, a Lambert conformal, and unprojected latitude and longitude. So you can see that the further away you move towards the east and west coast, north and south, the more uh, the distortion becomes extremely visible to the eye. And when we talk about projections, um, the NAD-3 and NAD-27s uh, that is implemented across the United States, they have been using those state plane coordinate systems that you see on your screen. So for example, when you look at the state of Texas, um, so each state for the most part has already selected at least one zone where the boundaries of those projections or zones are usually following the county lines. So the state of Texas has five zones, uh, 4201 through 4205. Uh, those are the five zones. All those five zones are based upon the Lambert conic projection. Other states, such as the state of New Mexico, west of us, they use the transfer Mercator, which includes three zones. And that's why you see those lines being divided, uh, running in a north-south direction. And if you look at the panhandle of Alaska, whose maximum dimension is more in a diagonal shape, they use the oblique Mercator projection. So I want you to remember uh, this, this image here and we'll go back to it because this is where the new redesigned low distortion projections will come in place in reference to the new NGS 2022 datum. So let's, uh, after covering those basic principles of the horizontal datum of NAD3 and NAD27, Let's talk about the vertical datum, which is a very big aspect of what we do and what uh, engineers depend uh, their design upon. I always like to start the vertical datum with a with a good example, and this is let's take the uh, mountain Everest, for instance. So mountain Everest. Has been measured, has its height measured multiple times through the past 150 years or more. What this uh, shows is how many variations of the actual height of mountain Everest we've had over those 150 years. When the British colonial ages uh, started in 1855, you can see that the height of mountain Everest was about 8,840 8, meters. Uh, at some point when it was measured in 1992 by some Italian explorers, it was 8,890. 
and most recently uh, it was uh, around the it was a little bit below eight eight thousand eight hundred and forty. The reason for that is because if you picture Mount Everest in its peak, the way it was measured, there were three or three components that indicated how that mountain was was measured or how that peak was measured. One, it was what type of geo it was being used. Two, what type of ellipsoid was being used? Was it a global one or was it a local one? Three, what type of um, instruments were used? How accurate and how precise were they? And fourth, which is, is part of the Earth basically moving, is that there's velocities. And right now, as of today, studies are showing that mountain Everest is still getting taller and taller or higher and higher. And the reason is because uh, the tectonic plate that is running underneath India is still crossing the tectonic plate that is uh, the the, uh, the Asian one in such a way where um, mountain Everest just gets compressed and starts getting higher. Of course, um, there's an there's a there's a um, there's that aspect, of course, but when you look at the difference of the height mountain of Everest having been measured about 40 meters in difference based upon what year it was measured, it mostly has to do with the geoid and the ellipsoid that was uh, utilized for the most part. So the questions we always have to ask ourselves when we when we measure any type of elevation is what is the true height elevation out there? The answer is there is no true elevation by definition. What is a correct statement is the elevation is based on this horizontal and vertical datum and the geoid that was utilized. So that's the question we should be asking. What was the geoid and what was the ellipsoid that was utilized? The second question is should I expect the same elevation occur or be measured every year? The short answer to that is no, unless we are talking about the same vertical datum, the same ellipsoid, the same geoid, the exact same survey methods to be utilized with the same instruments, um, then maybe we can uh, get uh, lucky enough to uh, be able to measure mountain Everest in uh, a couple of years and still get the same exact results. So the true, the, the quick answer to that is that uh, the only constant is change. And then the other one was, I think I answered this about how accurate my, my elevation is. Well, that depends on the precision of the instruments that are being utilized, depends on the accuracy of the geoid model and the efficiency uh, of the datum that is being used. So if everything is changing, if the elevations keep changing, the question is how can I rely on ever changing elevations? Well, the data, when it's published, it has to make it the, the answer to that is that the data when we when we publish it as surveyors or engineers, we have to maintain adequate metadata information. Information basically that others can replicate and check the information that we initially collected. Surveyors and engineers need to have that level of adequate information in order for others to be able to perform the checks over time and allow uh, our industries to perform backwards compatibilities and back checks from data that was collected 5, 10, 15, or 20 and 30 years ago. So when we discuss about the vertical datums, let's begin with the understanding that there are many vertical datums. Uh, there are vertical datums that are maintained by different cities, different counties, public organizations, and they all have reference to multiple vertical datums. The main categories we can break this into is the local and regional vertical datums and the national geodetic datums, which we're gonna be focusing on uh, for the most part. The local and regional uh, tidal datums, those refer usually to, they refer to the tidal datum that is defined by a certain phase of the tide. The tidal, the tidal datum is usually locally and usually valid only for a restricted area about where the tide gauge is used as a defining as defining the vertical datum of that particular area. Usually those are measured by tidal stations or prorated from them. And some examples of those are, let's say, the mean high water or the mean low water. And then the national 
geodetic datum. So those are the ones that are uh, currently developed by NGS and NOAA. And those are the NGS and NGVD 29. That was uh, that is a fixed reference that was adopted as a standard geodetic vertical datum for elevations uh, that were determined by leveling. And then the NAVD 88 was based on orthometric heights. Informally, uh, this was considered as a height above the mean sea level. So NGVD 29, when it was developed, it was based upon 26 tide gauges. Uh, most of them were towards the east coast and some of them were on towards the west coast. The problem with that is that when you're looking at all those um, tide gauges, they are they may have a different mean sea level there. Uh, so in terms of adjustment, that was quite problematic. And then the NAVD88 uh, was a sample of a leveled network only to the connection of the title of one tidal gauge, which was the Point Rimouski in Canada. Uh, NAVD88, uh, the good advantage of that one was that it utilized good gravimetric coverage of the United States. The problem with it was that the height was based on a single point and um, it minimized the changes of the USGS maps, but also added an about 30 centimeters of error relative to the global mean sea level that was relative to the father point Rimouski. So as a general comparison between NGVD 29 and AVD 88 was that Primarily, NGVD 29, when it was established, it was based upon 20, 26 local mean sea levels, uh, where the NAVD 88 was based upon one single one. NGVD 29 had various tidal epochs, and the reason is because each one of those mean sea level locations had a different tidal epoch, where the NAVD 88 had one single point that is based upon the 18.6 uh, uh, gauge cycle. And one thing to mention too is that the adjustment that was used on NAVD88 versus NGVD29 uh, was far more uh, dense. So you can see that the number of benchmarks and the um, miles of kilometer or the, the, the length of in kilometers of leveling that was performed for the establishment and the adjustment on NAVD88 far exceeded the one that was performed by NGVD29. Very few. Um, agencies use NGVD 29 versus NAVD 88 today, but there are still deeds that we come in reference to, especially around lakes that are maintained by the Corps of Engineers that have their uh, vertical datum reference to NGVD 29. So it's important to know uh, the one versus the other and what uh, impact it may have in depending on where we are across the United States. So this, this map shows uh, a high difference between NAVD 88 versus NGVD 29, and what is the datum shift um, of contours depending on where we are. Where we are here in uh, north, north central Texas, the relative difference between NGVD 29 and NAVD 88 is about maybe a tenth of a foot. Um, but the more you go towards the east coast or the west coast, uh, you may be either three meters or four meters above or below one or the other. So it's very important to know which uh, vertical datum you are using for that. So with that basic concept of what's happening today and what what are the general, uh, what are the, the horizontal and vertical datums that are being utilized today? Let's talk about what's coming in, NG in 2020, 2022, I'm sorry. So, NGS, uh, the National Geodetic Survey, is updating both the horizontal and vertical datums in 2022. In addition to the new datums, NGS has also called upon the states to determine the design and configuration of the new state plane coordinate systems. The state of Texas is currently in the process of solidifying those low distortion projections. And the new coordinate system is referred to in North America or the uh, continental United States as NATRF 2022. Also, there's going to be a new vertical datum, and that vertical datum, which will be refer referenced to the new geoid that will be developed in 2022, uh, is going to be referred to the NAPGD 
and stands for North American Pacific Geopotential Datum of 2022. So the horizontal datum, why did we have to get updated? Um, well, the re main reason is because due to the improvement of the GPS technology that we use today, the current datums that we have are unfortunately unable to keep up with the advancements of that technology. Therefore, the NGS has decided to incorporate new horizontal datums. The horizontal datum, which is known as the North American Terrestrial Reference Frame of 2022, will use the existing continuously operated reference stations, which is also re referenced to core stations, uh, which are basically GPS stations that are spread across the United States that are constantly logging data, uh, GPS data from satellites. And that allows us to track the global plate movement and apply a velocity measurement of the tectonic plates rotation. The horizontal datum will ut utilize the same ellipsoid, even though it's going to be a different datum, but it's going to use the same ellipsoid as N883, which is the GRS80 ellipsoid model. The velocity delta measurement will aid for future datum adjustments, just like future adjustments we have with N883, there will be future adjustments with the new datum as well. But the coordinates between each future datum adjustment they will remain static. Therefore, high level primary control points will have to account for velocity, location, and time of survey observations. The new vertical datum that will be released in 2022 will no longer depend on tidal gauges anymore. If you remember the NGVD29 and AVD88, they were dependent on those tidal gauges, whether it was a single one or 26 of them. So the new vertical datum will only be defined by a gravimetric geoid model. The vertical datum will be known as North American Pacific Geopotential Datum of 2022, and the gravitational adjustment of the new datum will culminate uh, with a redefined geoid. The new geoid will have a projected vertical accuracy of plus or minus one centimeter, and it will facilitate accuracies of orthometric heights from GPS observations up to two centimeters. Also, the current geo will be tied to existing National Geodetic Survey benchmarks uh, that have been adjusted multiple times due to subsidence, tectonic movements, or bad orthometric heights that uh, of NGS monuments having moved with time. Therefore, the orthometric heights will be applied on the new projects after 2022 will rely on a new dynamic vertical datum with less inherent error from GPS. So the local project datums may still use leveling for uh, orthometric heights, but it will be far more accurate and far more dynamic. Something else that is coming with a new datum is, um, and that is already creating some sort of a lot of confusion amongst the survey industry and I'm sure the engineering industry as well, the AC, AC industry in general, um, and the reason is because the international meter versus the US, or sorry, the international food versus the US survey food uh, will be implemented. So let's let's take it one step back here and let's mention that per NGS's policy, the meter is the official unit of measurement for the North American datum uh, of 83 and 2022. However, NGS supplemented N83 with published values both in US survey feed and international feed, depending on its state specific legislation. So NGS left it up to its state with the all with the current horizontal datum to define whether they're going to be using the international foot or the US survey foot. For example, Texas NA83 state projections are defined in US survey feed. Yet the upcoming NGS 2022 datum adjustments will be defined in meters and published in international food and international feed and meters only. According to the Texas Natural Resources Code right now, the current N883 and N827 state plane coordinate units of measurements is the US survey foot, the meter, and the Texas Vera. So right now, uh, the Texas Natural Resources Code has not been updated yet uh, in order to account for the modernization of the new state plane coordinate systems. So it will require Texas legislators to statutorily amend these units. 
So, with the, speaking of the new datum and what and both horizontal and vertical and what impact we will have after um, and how those will look like after 2022, let's talk about the load distortion projection. If you remember earlier, we talked about the projections across different states. Uh, so the image that I took here with a screenshot basically uh, zooms into the geographic region where we do the majority of our work these days, <clears throat> which covers Texas and all the surrounding states. So the map projection or linear projection is manifested as a difference in distance between a pair of projected coordinates and the true horizontal distance of the surface uh, Earth. So when NGS, currently the state of Texas has five zones. So it does not perform ideally and has a large grid to ground distortion. So when we measure distances, long distances with GPS observations, we have to account for what we refer to scale factors in order to be able to account for the curvature of the Earth. Uh, unfortunately, those current projections do not eliminate um, or they have a high level of distortion between grid and ground, which is why we have to account for those uh, the curvature of the Earth. And this is very important to surveyors and engineers because uh, it can account for completely different distances or very uh, vast differences in distances, volumes, um, areas when uh, when we're um, not accounting for that distortion. The new low distortion projections, that's where those benefits are going to come in because the grid to ground or the grid to surface distance will be far more closely related to one another. So for the majority of the projects that we work uh, across the state, there will not be a need to add a scale factor. When we refer to grid, in most cases, we will refer to ground as well. They will also be designed to be utilized with a new horizontal and vertical datums. So NGS will be will complement this with uh, a statewide single zone um, and optimize optimized transformations. So you look at the right here, you can see the state of Oklahoma and the state of Texas. And when you compare them to what we have now, where we have five zones in the state of Texas, we'll end up with approximately 50 zones, if I'm not mistaken. And each zone uh, will account be a low distortion projection area. The state of Oklahoma currently with an NAD83 uh, datum has two zones, which is the north and the south zone, and will end up with uh, 21 zones. So on a much larger scale, you will see that all the states are going towards that direction, and more states will 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 start preparing low, those designing those low distortion projections uh, according to their needs. Uh, the low distortion projection in Oklahoma, for example, uh, they were driven from the Oklahoma Department of Transportation in coordination with all the other mapping agencies of the state. The state of Texas has done exactly the same thing. It was led by the Texas Department of Transportation in, coordinator, in coordination with all uh, the mapping agencies of the state and all of the regional surveyors in the state. Uh, so there was a lot of conversation going back and forth to make sure that uh, we we come up with uh, the best possible low distortion projections that we will be probably using for the next 40 to 50 years. So they're not going to go away anytime soon. So what is the general impact uh, of the projects? Well, the primary thing is currently TxDOT, for example, and the survey standards that we do for the Texas Department of Transportation, they require projects to be scaled from grid to surface with a predefined TxDOT county-based scale factor or a project-specific scale factor. So those scale factors are basically scale factors with the current datums that we have to account for because of the high level of distortion that we're seeing between the current datum and the actual curvature of the Earth. This practice ensures that measurements or cold distances basically depict close on the ground distances. This will be virtually be eliminated with a new low distortion projections and the need for those scale factors will be extremely minimal. It will also reduce the confusion between the US survey foot and the international foot. Uh, 
Another impact it will have is that we will be required even more than before to maintain good and accurate metadata records which for every single project that we do. So one of the things that have been happening for the past 20, 30 years is that servers and engineers that have been practicing back in the 80s and the 70s, even though those national geodetic datums existed, the technology was not such where um, most of our projects depended on those national geodetic datums. A lot of servers and engineers used either local vertical datums or local coordinate systems. It was right after the 90s when the, with the evolution of the GPS, where GPS is probably one of the most common survey instruments you will find uh, among surveyors these days, that the need to have a better understanding and a more modernized geodetic datum uh, is more imperative than, than before. But what's more also more important imperative than before is that we keep good information that define our basis of bearing for all the survey work that we do and define what is our horizontal and vertical datum. So in an ideal world, every survey or engineering project should uh, have enough metadata records that will include the low distortion projection we're working on, the survey date, uh, what was the horizontal and vertical datums that were used, what geoid did we use, and what unit of measurement that we use. So NGS will provide transformation, also will provide transformation tools in the future uh, once the new datums are finalized um, and those projections are finalized in order for us to be able to uh, transform and have that backwards compatibility between the new 2022 coordinate system and datums uh, with the, uh, the older ones, the current 83 and 27. But just like before, I mentioned there's tools that convert 83 to 27. Those conversion tools will still have uh, some sort of error or distortion incorporated when transforming from one coordinate system to the other. So if we're looking for a high accuracy and precision, trans precise transformation from one coordinate system to the other. Almost definitely, we will have to verify this information on the ground with um, uh, and verify this information, those coordinates with physical measurements on the ground. So with that being said, uh, I would like to leave the last uh, 13 or 14 minutes uh, for uh, questions. Uh, right here, I have my personal uh, information if you wish to uh, email me. I also have Trevor Jeremy's uh, email information, uh, my colleague and uh, uh, survey team leader in our Oklahoma City that was uh, highly involved with uh, the uh, design and development of the low distortion projections in the state of Oklahoma. So um, with that, I will uh, close. Uh, so Jeremy, do we have any questions? Hi, Voss. Uh, we do actually have a couple of questions in here. Uh, somebody asked, uh, so the true height elevation, I assume this would be um, of Mount Everest, will never be known? We will have a true known elevation as long as we have enough metadata. As long as we have and carry enough information where we can have a good reference point, uh, meaning we have to define what is our geoid, what uh, ellipsoid did we use, in, in other words, what datum did we use, uh, as long as we have this information and the survey date, as long as we have this information in place for every type of survey that we do or for every type of information that engineering design information depends upon, uh, then that will be our true elevation based upon that metadata. All right. Um, looking at the maps uh, that you had of the US and stuff, why why would you choose one projection over another and why is it not consistent state to state doesn't that cause confusion and isn't that doesn't that think make things more difficult uh i suppose we are we referring to this map here where we're showing all the uh different projections or uh, no, the ones it was the one before that or a couple before that where you had all the the zones showing in each state this one here? Yeah, that one there. OK, so this is the current uh, zone system that is being utilized. And the reason 
the reason that those projections were initially selected was to account for as little distortion at the time with the known technology that we had back in the 80s uh, for each zone. Generally speaking, when you look at those zones, and this is where the low distortion projections come even become more applicable. If you look, for example, at 4202 that is highlighted here, um, every projection has a distortion between grid and ground as it is. So if you look at 4202, the closer you are towards the centroid of that particular projection, the less distortion you will have. Um, the further away you move from that uh, zone and about to touch another one, the more distortion you will have, which means that when you have a long linear project for a highway project or a pipeline or a water line, and it's running for miles and miles and miles long, where you have to excavate and account for volumes during construction, that's where it's even more important that you account for that curvature of the earth, including that scale factor. If, if we had a single um, projection, which we could have, a single projection for the whole state of Texas, then the amount of distortion would have been even higher. So that, and that is the purpose of the new low distortion projection, which is why they have been broken down in coordination with departments of transportation and other agencies to what looks like uh, this one here for the state of Texas. So you can see that the green areas are basically carrying a distortion of about uh, 20 parts per million per mile, which is very little, which means that for every mile of survey, uh, you will be looking at about maybe possibly a tenth of horizontal distortion, which is far greater than what we have today. Um, it will be a little interesting in areas where it's coming close to those uh, low distortion lines and trying to decide which one am I going to use or if I have a project that is crossing from one um, low distortion projection to another, what do I use? Well, it, it depends. It's a case by case. One, obviously, if you're working with the, the Texas Department of Transportation, you have to coordinate with the local district but, or your client. But uh, uh, in most cases, if it only exceeds maybe half a mile past that one, from one zone to the other, those low distortion projections generally have been designed in such a way where they can carry a, less of a distortion up to maybe a couple of miles before, beyond them. So there's a little bit of overlap between them. And you can see just like the current uh, projections, they're, they're defined by zone. Uh, it will be even more important for us. I mean, you can see that we're going from five zones to almost 50 here. So it's going to be even more important than before that we define which zone we're going to be on. And those zones, uh, they are either using the Lambert projection or the Trasher Mercator projection or the oblique. You can see that some of them that are running more in an east-west direction, they're using the, the Lambert one, like this one here for Medina County. You come to our area in the DFW and we're using the Transfer Mercator for those surrounding counties in our area. Then you go into Washington County and you can see that uh, uh, those counties that are surrounded by Washington County, called Washington here, use the oblique Mercator. So we're not anymore using just the same type of projection. We're using a different type of projection depending on the geographic region we're working on. Excellent. And we'll have time for one last question. Uh, what are some of the implications for state and interstate gas and oil pipelines? That's an excellent question. Um, the, the, it's going to be exactly the same implication that we have today. Um, the only difference is that uh, depending on the length of that project, when we talk about grid and ground, most likely we will be talking exactly about the same thing, which means there will not be a need for us using custom scale factors or county scale factors. See, one of the things that we have to understand, with, which is what's happening here, and it's creating a lot of confusion uh, for a lot of engineering design and surveyors as well, is that once we move from those projected state plane grid coordinates and we move to any surface, technically speaking, we're moving into an arbitrary coordinate system that has its basis to grid. 
So what's happening is if I as a surveyor decide to create a custom um, scale factor for a project to account for the curvature of the earth based upon the geographic region that I'm surveying, I'm going to have my own scale factor. And if somebody else comes behind me and surveys an adjacent area and creates his own custom scale factor, those two projects are not going to line up unless we bring them back to grid, back to those projected coordinates. And that's where those low distortion projections are going to be extremely beneficiary because we're going to be talking about the same thing, apples to apples. So overall, I see this as a huge benefit uh, moving to the new uh, projection. Fantastic. Well, Voss, thank you very much. It was a lot of great information, and um, I think everybody learned a lot listening to, to your presentation. Um, for everybody out there, thanks for attending today. Our virtual brown bag series continues through April. Uh, next week on the 31st at noon, we have a Dean's listening, se listening session. And on April 2nd, we will hear from the bioengineering department about self-disinfecting nanocomposites to prevent infections. So a couple of good uh, opportunities next week. You can find those on our website and the link is in the chat at the moment. Voss, again, thank you very much and everybody else have a great weekend. Thank you very much for having me.